Hello everybody, Adrian Plus here. Yeah, and Bridget, hello. Well, this is number 54. It is. I'm afraid my voice is a little bit, um, a bit strained, my throat's a bit strained today, but we'll do our best. Yeah. We'll, we'll get there. Yeah, and it's so interesting doing something once a week, isn't it? Because each week something seems to happen that triggers off all sorts of other things. And, and I think we would have been saying that... Uh, the big thing this week is the Euros and of course you know the the football it seems to be dominating everybody and giving people lots of hope but it's in the middle of that that something happened that well it, I, so I found it very striking really um, I, I'm sure everybody even those who aren't particularly interested in football will know that a, a, a Danish player called uh, Christian Eriksson mm. collapsed just before half time when Denmark were playing Poland, um, uh, Finland, sorry, sorry, Finland, playing Finland, and um, just collapsed. He wasn't barged into. No. It was obviously a, a heart problem. Um, and doctors struggled for his life, and the match was stopped, of course. Mm. And a, a most odd hush descended mm. on the um, the stadium. Mm. I, I think one a manager or assistant manager was in tears, something mm. like that. Mm. Um, I think it was so significant because it was in the middle of us hearing about thousands of deaths and all over the world, but suddenly the whole focus was on this one young man and, and his team surrounding him and creating a sort of human shield to keep the press away from seeing what was happening. And I suppose it was. I, I don't think I've seen a hush like that no. for a very long time. Um, and I, I really tried to think what it was or what it meant. And I, I, I suppose I only know what it means for me. Um, that I was thinking about, and I know I'm always blethering on about C.S. Lewis because he's always said things better than I could long before I did. Um, and there's one book in which he says something about friendship being unnecessary uh, like philosophy and like art because they have no actual survival value but they're the things that make survival worthwhile mm. and um, of course he doesn't mention football I don't think C.S. Lewis was a great football fan but it is true that, that during this time this long time I'm sure everybody's had a sort of little mental list of things that would make survival worthwhile and they're all different like um, I don't know, hugging people you love, meeting people to do things you enjoy, like choirs or church services or a pint in the pub, or just, for me, sitting in cafes, just watching people, um, um, theatre trips, all sorts of things. And I think that what shocked me as I watched what happened in the football stadium, this frozen chill of disappointment um, that for football lovers... As you said, really, it was an event that was supposed to be an example of the things that make survival worthwhile. Yeah, A absolutely. safe little two-hour holiday yeah. from the awful horrors of the last year yeah. and a half. And suddenly, inexplicably, this spectre of death walks right into the middle of it, yeah. like a punch in the face, um, that seeming to say will never escape from the darkness and... Um, I know in my heart I believe that's a, that's a false thought um, mm. and I think those of us who are fortunate enough to have survived the, the pandemic will find that those things will return and they mm. will be valuable mm. but I think that's it was the wrong time and the wrong place oh. at that moment uh, for that kind of near disaster. I guess it was. I mean, to me, what happened was it broke into the... I was just thinking of the pundits, of the um, people sitting there doing the commentary. And uh, and one of them, his name has just disappeared out of my head at the moment. So, um, one of the, the one woman who was there. Um, and she said, I think I'll just phone my mum and tell her I love her. Everything suddenly turned on its head. Mm -hmm. And what mattered wasn't at that moment who won that game, but was whether this young man was alive or not alive or whatever. Yeah, I think that's absolutely, absolutely right. Mm. Um, and we've had emails, haven't we? Um, well, we have, and week. they and and I I just get a feeling that that you know last week you talked about coming through this time 
and the new normal being that we walk with a limp mm. and there was an interview I don't even think you saw it necessarily but it was with um, Sophie Wessex talking yeah. about the Duke of Edinburgh her father-in-law yeah. and talking about his death and she was saying that she like many 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 people in this country has now experienced loss mm. and that grief is such a strange thing because you can be feeling fine everything's fine everything's okay and then something happens some little memory some trigger and the grief overwhelms you maybe only for a little while and even as she was sitting there she said she said it's it's times when you are doing something that you would have done together and she said, you know, because of the pandemic, people haven't been together, so they haven't been doing those things, and that the grief, therefore, will take a lot longer to work through people. I thought that was absolutely right, really. Yeah. Who was doing the interview? It was uh, Naga, Manchetti, Naga Manchetti, and it oh, was, right. but it was her, really. It was, it yeah. was it's Sophie Wessett simply talking, not about the Duke of Edinburgh or being the Duke of Edinburgh or being part of the royal family, just talking about her father-in-law. Yeah. Um, and I thought, yes, it does reflect so many, many, many people, really. We had an email uh, from a lady who said, the past 18 months have been very strange. And she very kindly says, your podcast helped with that. I don't think she meant making it very strange. I hope she meant <laughs> She but might have done. She says, unlike most people, it seems I've felt worse as things seem to be hopefully improving. I'm not unused to this feeling. Often I cope well in a crisis and then deal with my own thoughts and feelings when everyone else around me seems to have moved on. And one of the additional challenges, she says, is her experience of depression and anxiety, which somehow seem to relish these times. And it, she has it, she has a name for her depression. I don't know if we ought to <laughs> say it, but it's strange, she says, I know, but it seems to help to give him a personality of his yeah. own. Needless to say, this depression of mine has been visiting fairly regularly recently. Yeah. I found that very interesting because I think a lot of people relate to that, Adrian, to the fact that when you're in the middle of a crisis, there's something kind of happens, you, you, you sort of firm up, you cope with it. And then as things start apparently to get better, the yeah. your wobbliness seems to be worse hmm. um i don't think i've ever given my wobbliness a name but uh, but on the other hand you know we talked last week about parallel universes yeah. and that in a way this new normal is kind of a parallel universe to home. we have some great things sent to us about their parallel universes and one person said one thing occurred to me namely that products would come with full and clear instructions written on paper and in English, or is that just nostalgia? <laughs> she says, as I tackled my jungle yesterday, I thought in a parallel universe, there would be no more ground elder. Oh, so that is going to be in my parallel universe. Right. Do you remember I was talking about the yes, fact I that do, you, yeah. you go on and on, you think you've got rid of it and then it pops up again. And she did like the idea of the fat cream and chocolate. She thought that would be great. So uh, that was her parallel universe. And I think somebody else said about their yeah, parallel universe. Yeah, somebody else said in my parallel universe, my internet won't go off just in the middle of something. In my parallel universe, if I eat a piece of cake, I won't put weight on. Uh, in my parallel universe, when I exercise, I'll lose weight. In my parallel universe, the weather forecasters will get it right. In my parallel universe, drivers will follow the highway code. I like your new predictions for five a day. Just up my street. Well, apart from the wine, not being keen on that. Prefer hot Ribena, sugar-free, of course. <laughs> you know, we'd love to hear any more of your parallel universes. Um, yeah, the ground elder has stayed with me. Just one more uh, uh, email I'd love to share with you actually because I don't know if you remember again last week talking about last week but we were talking about well we mentioned CM Glass do you remember and we were yeah, saying yeah, that yeah. 
that that the interesting thing about Seam Glass was that it came out of a factory closing down and living now in the north we know how many industries have closed down and the grief that that's caused and of course we are in a situation where lots of little businesses might not make it and a lot of sadness is going to be caused by that and and then we were talking weren't we about going on to Seam Beach and and mm. finding these tiny bits of glass that that were chucked into the sea but have now come back as tiny little glossed, mm. rubbed jewels, really. And somebody wrote to say, and I think it was in connection with this, she said she went on an inner healing type of thing. And that at one point they were talking about our lives as a song, and all she could think of was a hundred sadnesses. And she said to God, well, my life is just a lament. And she said she very rarely hears God in any direct way. I, I think many people will relate to that, Adrian. But she said, I really felt that he said back, yes, but if you give it to me, I'll add another line which will make it beautiful. Oh, and I, I, yeah. yeah, it, it is. It yeah. really is. It's that sense that out of the bleakness, mm. something really mm. amazing but different maybe small maybe shiny maybe might happen mm. and one thing if we're talking about us this week we went to the transporter bridge didn't we in uh, in middlesbrough talking about things that did have a purpose and were mighty that's an extraordinary thing to see close up isn't it it is it, it, it's an extraordinary bridge that was uh, developed to it has a sort of gondola that used to carry the cars and that hangs underneath, underneath it, doesn't it? it and it used to take them across the river but now doesn't and it hopefully will be repaired but when we sat there looking at it, i thought here's something else something else that was created with confidence and and used and useful and great brilliant amazing engineering mm. and uh and now it's redundant, certainly at the moment, whether it will be forever. And the thing that we noticed particularly was that it was painted the most gloriously bright blue. Yeah, it was. It looked new, actually, mm. from where we were. Why did that have such a, an effect on you, do you think? Well, I think for me, Adrian, it's because, well, you know why. It's because of a poem you wrote after a really long, bleak, dark time. Well, I didn't. I didn't connect it to it at all at the time. No, but, but you asked me if I would, yeah, would read just it. read yeah. it because I think there is something about bright paint that is. Well, read the poem. I'll read it. It's just called Shades of Blue. Does winter end in seaside towns when councils paint anew? the railings on the promenade in hopeful shades of blue. And if the tide loved Brighton Beach, would God come down and say, with gentle hands upon the surf, you need not turn today? <laughs> Will massive Church of England bells have faith enough to ring and overcome their weariness when they believe in spring? Are there machines for measuring the power of my prayers? And anyway, and anyway, and anyway, who cares? I think you care, but gently. I think because you do, the colour of my sadness is a hopeful shade of blue. Mm. And, and I think because of that, written so long ago, it gave me a lot of hope at the time. Just that little, I think you care, but gently. And I think mm. because you do, the colour of my sadness is a hopeful shade of blue. That somehow seeing the brilliant blue of the transporter bridge, there's still hope. Maybe it will come back to life. Um, mm. Hanging on to hope. Hanging on to hope. You know... Uh, we have a friend, don't we, uh, called Rob Halligan, and uh, one of the songs that he sings is not one that he's written. It's a, a, a well, hymn. The words. Are words, the words. Are, yeah. It's a hymn by somebody called Fanny Cosby, who was blind, wasn't she? Mm -hmm. And one line of that song, and Rob sings it fantastically, if you want to look it up, but is there are shadows in the valley, but there's sunshine on the hill. That's right, yeah. We've heard, heard him sing that many times. We have, but there's yeah. something about that that 
Yes, there are shadows. Mm -hmm. But if you look up, there's something different. Yeah. I think it's um, very easy to miss those things. I was very taken this week because I was um, thinking about the Beatitudes. And Beatitudes are like prodigal son, aren't they? They're like a, a never-ending lemon that you squeeze something out of. And... Um, well, they're puzzling. They are, they are puzzling, and there there are various ways of interpreting them. Obviously, because I looked at one or two of the commentaries on them, and for instance, one commentator commented on the one that says, "Blessed are those who mourn." As an American commentary, I think, and he said, um, "Of course, this doesn't mean all mourning; it just means mourning of your sin." That if you sin, you don't want to sin, and therefore you decide not to sin. And most of the comments on most of the Beatitudes, as you go down the list, were saying, this is something to teach you how to live. And you you know, look, looking up for, out to come out of the shadows, you see some surprising things sometimes. I mean, it seems to me as though the Beatitudes are not at all like that. Mm. That actually... They're saying, have, have a look through this list because you're almost l certain to come across something that is you. And if you do, mm -hmm. you're lucky. It's like a free gift. I mean, if you're poor in spirit, if you think, I'm not, I don't have much, much zip, much yeah. in my spirit. Mm. And Jesus is saying, okay, I get that, but look. I've known a lot of people who are poor in spirit. That doesn't mean they're not going to do stuff for me. It doesn't mean they're not going to become stronger in spirit. But don't beat yourself up. Mm. Or the meek, blessed are the meek, mm. for they shall inherit the earth. Someone who says, I feel, I feel I'm, I'm, one, I'm not one of the confident ones. I'm not one of the ones who speaks out. I, I'm, I'm rather nervous about speaking out. And Jesus says, I like meekness. It's not exactly humility, but it's it's mm. it's a, it's a smallness, mm. and I made myself small to be on the earth, mm. uh, so that I could be. With it. And so I think it's well worth reading the Beatitudes, mm. and just asking yourself which of these is me, and in which way is it meant to encourage me, not to mm. discipline me, mm. but to encourage me. I was slightly puzzled you saying about the morning being for sin. I mean, I, I'd not never really thought of that. Blessed are right. those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mm. I, 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 I suppose I'd always thought of that as meaning if there's something about allowing yourself to feel allowing yourself to mourn allowing yourself to be part of humanity mm. that is hurting and 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 that you're on god's side you'll receive yeah. comfort in a strange way because you care i don't know maybe that's even more tangled maybe we need to well I there's never also of it as the, being mourning no nor, nor me i mean the fact that you understand mourning that you have you've had it in your heart and therefore god might say to you you have a very valuable tool there you understand what it means to absolutely mourn. well that's what i and, think and you i know, can that, use that. That, that that i would agree with you that that is that that is a blessing yes yeah. absolutely and it's a bit uh, of a painful one sometimes yeah of course, um, of course it is yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah. and blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness it's it's saying, isn't it, it, this is great that this is what you want. Absolutely. It's great that this is what you want. Not, this is terrible that you haven't achieved what you want to achieve, but you are blessed because you have this hunger yeah. uh, to, to be the right kind of person. Yeah. And we can work on that. We can work with that um, and, and produce yes, something Yes, well, actually, really we were good. talking to somebody just very recently, weren't we, who's beginning to see it as a gift that... That, that the person that he has been all his life, um, that that he doesn't want to be that anymore. That mm. 
if you like, he does hunger and thirst after righteousness now. Yeah. He, he wants the hope. He f he's beginning to have a hope within him that yeah. some of the patterns of behavior that have dominated his life mm. with good reason, because there's every reason why he should be bitter, every reason why he should be angry, but that, that he is discovering to his joy, really, mm. that, that he's he's no longer that person that that yeah. he that he's actually without realizing it wanting something quite different and that's taken his life it has time, it has it? So but but i agree with you the danger is you look at something like you know blessed are those who hunger for righteousness all right that's what i should be doing i yeah, should be hungering yeah. for righteousness and i'm not but actually no, you say oh look there's someone who hungers and thirsts after righteousness yeah. isn't that wonderful Blessed are the peacemakers. They may not be have actually have a religious faith or a Christian faith, but the people who all their lives have been have been bringing peace mm. where there was conflict, mm. and one one day they will meet Jesus and he'll say, "You and I have a lot in common." Yes. We we both worked for peace. Yeah. So, yeah. Have a look yeah. at the beatitudes. Absolutely. See what there is yeah. for you. I I think you know. Let's just let's just. I don't. Know, we're finishing with this, but just somebody else who wrote to us this week because I think it fits with what we're talking about really uh, they said I trust God's purposes even if I struggle deeply with the necessary pain within them I'm sure God's pleased to know my trust in him far far outweighs trust in myself but what I'm learning is that in trusting him He's empowering me to actually believe in him working in and through me and in a way that's what we were just saying isn't it mm. so I can believe more in myself through him and crack on with living a life full of fullness and purpose knowing I'm deeply held and secure mm. and I think in a way that's one of the things we're talking about you can crack on because you know it's it's okay to be where you are yeah, yeah whether you do feel poor in spirit whether you do yeah. feel have a look see have a look it's it's like a little treasure chest yeah see see if you're there yeah. in there somewhere and, and we'd love to hear about your parallel universes or anything else you'd like to share with us yeah my voice is nearly gone <laughs> yeah. see you next week bye-bye <laughs>